Welcome all to your first history class since the break. If you remember, we left off with the investiture controversy. So before we dive right back in, make sure everybody has your paper and pen or pencil, preferably pencil, in front of you so that you're taking good notes during this lecture. I can see you through your camera, so make sure you're taking good notes. In a word, what do you think the investiture controversy is really about? Investiture, invest, vesting, vestments. Is this ringing a bell? It should be making you think of priests and their vestments, the clothes that they wear. Who is it that gives a priest their special clothes? That is, in other words, who is it that gives a priest their special authority? Is it the king or is it church officials? Who appoints church officials? Is it the state or the church? This is the investiture controversy. So even bigger than the question of who can appoint priests and other church officials is who has power in the medieval world? Is it the state or the church? It's a contest between the kings and the emperors of Europe and the pope. So pope versus emperor. We're going to focus in on two very key characters when it comes to studying the investiture controversy. Pope Gregory VII on the church side of things. Before he became Pope, however, his name was Hildebrand. And he was a Benedictine monk. He, though not impressive in physical stature, was impressive in wisdom. And he advised five popes, actually, before he became Pope. When he did become Pope at this time, it was common practice for emperors, specifically the Holy Roman Emperor, to appoint church officials. So investiture, in this sense, had been going on for a while. And Gregory VII was very skeptical about the goodness of this practice for the church. So... He's going to bring this into question. On the state side of things, you have Henry IV of Germany. And remember, the German Empire at this time is the Holy Roman Empire. It's primarily located within the territor territory of Germany, but the Holy Roman Empire is how we're going to refer to it. So Henry IV became emperor at six years old until he was old enough to rule for himself. His mother ruled on his behalf. But by the time he was 19, he was well established as emperor. Do you think you'd be equipped to be emperor by the time you graduated Live Oak? Well, that was Henry IV. So what is the dominant social system of the medieval world? Everybody should know this. Yell it out. The feudal system. Very good. I know all of you got it right. The feudal system is a very strict and organized understanding of a hierarchical order of the social world. So there's somebody at the top, somebody beneath them, somebody beneath them, all the way down. Everybody's got somebody they look to and somebody they are responsible for. So... If your position within the levels of this structure comes into question, that's going to cause chaos, right? So if you have that background, then you know why the investiture controversy is so important. Who's on top and who's beneath? So <clears throat> at the top, we all know is the king. That's how we've understood it. Beneath them, he has, he has kings of particular sub-kingdoms, then lords, then vassals, knights, peasants, all the way down. 
But where, where within this hierarchy is the church? That's the question. So the way it's been operating is the king's at the top, so he has the power to appoint anybody that lives on his land. And the local priest has to live on his land. And so he is his patron. So the parish is there. And um, so because the king wants a parish for his kingdom, wants a priest for his particular um, parishes within the kingdom, he appoints those offices and goes on about his day, just like he appoints every other office. But if kings are not trained in theology, uh, not trained as pastors the way church officials are, then how is it that they're qualified to appoint church officials themselves, right? Um, are they going... There might be a few issues, issues here, right? Can you think of some possible negatives to somebody outside of the church appointing somebody to a position within the church? Think about that for a second. So we're going to come back to what those might possibly be. Now let's think about the precedent that's established this. Let's go back to Pepin the Short. Remember, Pepin wants to establish his kingdom within the Frankish Empire. But he's not part of the Merovingian dynasty, which is a problem. Because up until now, every Frankish ruler has been the natural heir, and um, the dynasty has continued up until now, since Merovingian. But now Pepin says, I don't want to just be mayor of the palace. I want to be the true ruler. And so who does he get to support him in this cause? You remember? It's the Pope. And so when the Pope, when he helps him to, um, to establish peace within the papal kingdoms, in return, the Pope comes and helps Pepin establish his rule with his people. Because if the Pope supports you, then everybody wants to listen to the Pope. He's the ultimate celebrity of the medieval world. And so there you go, you're, you're set. The Carolingian Empire is now established. So who has the power in this situation? Is it the king or is it the Pope? Well, it seems as though it's the Pope. Whatever... Nobody trusted the king, but when the Pope said yes, everybody went with it. So it seems as though the Pope has power over the state. But I also want you to remember back to the way the Pope at this time invoked the donation of Constantine. Who can remember what the donation of Constantine is? This was a document that was discovered late after Constantine's death at the time of Pepin the Short that the Pope used to establish the papal kingdoms. So the document allegedly said that Constantine, the emperor, not a church official, the emperor gave land to the papacy um, and also gave him a few other privileges, one of those being the ability to appoint the Holy Roman Emperor, which we'll see will come into effect with Charlemagne. So then you've got Charlemagne, the son of Pepin the Short, Charles the Great, and when he's visiting the Pope, what unexpected thing happens when they're in a church service. The Pope reaches for a crown and crowns Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor, in front of, front of everybody. Was Charlemagne excited about this? Mm, we're not sure. He didn't seem to invoke the title thereafter. And we speculated as to a few possibilities for why this was in class. Probably because if he called himself Holy Roman Emperor now, 
then he would be admitting that the, he got his authority from the Pope because the Pope is the one that crowned him. Because he refused or just neglected to invoke that title, then he just continued to be the ruler of the Frankish Empire and said, you know what, I'm just going to make, I'm, I'm just my own ruler, I don't take anything from the Pope. So already you've got a complicated relationship of who's in charge. Is it the Pope or is it the kings? We can see that both are trying to maintain their authority separate from the other person. Okay, so that's the background. Now we're thinking still about the possible negative effects that investiture could have on the church. Now, um, okay, so Gregory VII, he ended up asserting complete authority over the emperor when he told Henry IV that he was not allowed anymore to appoint church officials. He forbids it. How do you think Henry IV handled this? Mm, he threw a fit. This infuriated him. So in response, he called a special meeting called the Synod of Worms. Worms, or if you were just reading it on a paper, you'd think it would say worms. This is not a place where a bunch of earthworms decided to show up to a meeting and discuss politics. The Synod of Worms was a meeting that occurred in the city of Worms in Germany. And um, this is where Henry IV, along with other rulers, decided to depose the Pope, meaning they kicked him out of office. In response, do you think Gregory VII just laid down and took it? No. He excommunicated Henry IV now. So we've got a king that has just kicked a pope out of office and a pope that's just kicked the king out of the church. What do you think is worse? Who do you think won here? Who out kicked out the other person? Well, Henry continues going on about his business until all of a sudden he realizes he's losing quite a bit of popularity with people. Turns out that being kicked out of the church is a huge problem for the medieval society. It's a real big issue to have to no longer be a member within the church, to no longer have any rights. You're not able to commune with other believers anymore. You're not able to take the Eucharist or receive any of the other sacraments. And so uh, this, this is a big issue that Henry IV is not going to be able to ignore. So this is where the story gets really interesting. In order to fix this situation, Henry IV does something quite radical that you could never imagine a political leader of today doing. He and his wife and his three children travel across the Alps from Germany to Canosa, where the Pope is living. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. Here we are. Spares where, or however you pronounce that, um, this is where he begins his journey. He travels 720 kilometers all the way to Canosa. On horseback? No. On foot. This is a king. This is actually the Holy Roman Emperor that decides to do this. Why? And not just at any time of the year, but through midwinter. This, he goes up 7,000 meters in altitude and almost the same back down, trudging through the snow. He's, he's walking almost halfway 
or more than halfway across the width of all of continental Europe to do this. Upon reaching Canosa, he has to wait three days out in the snow, barefoot, in the rags of a peasant. Why is he doing this? He's doing it for penance. He's trying to convince Gregory VII that he is repentant and truly wants to re-enter the church and have his excommunication renounced. So after three days of begging on his knees, barefoot in the snow, suffering after three months of travel across the Alps, Gregory VII finally gives in. And he allows him to come in. Henry IV bows down at his feet and kisses his feet. And Gregory VII grants him... Um, renounces his excommunication and then accepts him back into the church. So, this is the Holy Roman Emperor, remember. Can you imagine the President of the United States doing something like this to a religious leader? These are, this is one of the most dramatic stories, truly, of the Middle Ages. And so, he is forgiven. You think everything's okay now? It's not over, despite what you might think. Back in Germany, remember this is a three-month journey that he's been on. Back in Germany, the people have decided to appoint a new ruler. And his name is Rudolf. Ugh. Rudolf. Rudolf was selected by the people to be the new king. So for years, then after, Henry and Rudolf struggled. And naturally, who do you think Gregory VII supported as the person that should be the ruler? Naturally, Rudolf. And this infuriated Henry so much that even after the incredible feat of repentance, of seeming repentance, that he had undergone the pain Three months of painful trudging through the snow in the Alps. Even after this, Gregory... Even after this, when he found out that Gregory supported Rudolph, Henry deposed again Gregory. And so their rivalry continues. When Rudolf was killed, Henry openly declared war on Rome. Gregory VII fled for his life because he had no way to support, to defend himself. For a year then, with Gregory VII out of commission, Henry got what he wanted. But then his own son rose up in rebellion against him. And while Henry was preparing for battle, he died in 1106 at the age of 57. Before he died, though, Gregory VII excommunicated him, excommunicated him once again. And so he died excommunicated. Gregory also died in exile due to strain and bad nerves, which we can assume was probably mostly caused by Henry. So strong and stubborn to the end, they both died defeated. And the issue of authority continued between popes and emperors, the church and the state through the Middle Ages, and it continues even today. Anybody not able to go to church right now due to prohibitions by the government? I'm not. Granted, this is different from investiture. We're not talking about appointing officials within the church. But it still raises the question of authority, which was the deep-seated issue of the investiture controversy. Does the government have authority over the church? Are churches not meeting right now because they freely choose to submit to the state? Or are they actually under the state's authority. 
and does the distinction make a difference?